coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. For fans of Dr. Strangelove and its wonderful spoof on the missile gap, we have to do something about this balloon gap. The balloon gap, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're lagging behind in balloon technology. Um, I think, well, you know, they say never attribute to malice that which is adequately, ex adequately explained by stupidity. Yep. And my answer tends to be with all of these things, oh, it's probably stupidity just all the way up and down, always. But if it were malice, it's either a false flag to distract us from what's happening in Ukraine, <laughs> or, or it's... I knew this was going to be a good episode. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> or <laughs> it's definitely, actually, interdimensional entities that are preying on our godlessness and fear. So... <gasps> Yeah, it's got to be that. I mean, there really aren't say, any. Say more. I mean, there are definitely interdimensional entities preying on our godlessness and fear, but I associate them more with, like, the statue now by Shazia Sikhanada in the New York courthouse, like the kind of, <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. idol, yeah. idols that we raise to abortion. But but you think that it's possible that these UFOs are also somehow associated with uh, with the demons? Interdimensional. Uh, yeah, it's, I didn't know we were going to go, like, you know, the interstellar route. And or demons. Thanks, Helen. <laughs> we're gonna be Just wait. Rolling. We're gonna be writing a lot more about this on the site. So I actually really want to know, like, what, yeah. what makes you think that this particular series of phenomena is attributable <laughs> to demonic activity? <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to the Roundtable Podcast, your weekly publishers and editors podcast here at the American Mind. I'm your host, Spencer Clavin, features editor of the American Mind and associate editor of the Claremont Review of Books. I am joined by managing editor Seth Barron, contributing editor Helen Roy, and publisher and president Ryan Williams. Always great to have Helen joining us. I think this is going to be a really fun one, um, even if not all of the things we're talking about are uh, strictly speaking fun. They're at least out of left field enough to make this an interesting day. Uh, it's going to be uh, this is going to be the episode where I just kind of wind the gang up and let the hot takes fly. I think I um, my, my personal experience of the news this week has been that uh, my book came out this week. And so I've been doing all these interviews and it's like I, every now and then I poke my head up and look at what's going on in the news cycle. And I feel like I'm, I'm in a Salvador Dali painting or something. It's like UFOs are the top story in Chernobyl in Ohio. And I go on these shows and they're like, you know, yes, coming up at eight, uh, UFOs over the, the American sky. So um, that's what we're going to start with. We're going to start with UFOs, which obviously stands for unidentified flying object, doesn't necessarily have to be an alien. And in fact, the Wall Street Journal ran a headline, could these UFOs be aliens? Some see official denials as hot air. So all eagles are birds, but not all birds are eagles. All aliens are pilot UFOs, but not all UFOs are piloted by aliens. And the first UFO, which then I, <laughs> I guess became an IO, I was about to say an FO, but no, an, an IO, uh, that we that we saw was the Chinese spy balloon. We talked about that last week, but they shot that out of the sky. Now I think we're up to four, uh, including that spy balloon. There have been three other shoot downs by fighter jets in recent days. And these are objects that seem to be traveling pretty slowly through the air. I, I guess the jets kept kind of outstripping them. And uh, the government is vociferously denying that there is any kind of alien activity going on here, although I've seen a lot of speculation floating around online. The kind of amusing feature of this is, like, if it's not insane, then it's just terrifying because the alternative explanation for the for aliens is, you know, we've kind of increased the precision of our measuring instruments over the last week or so in the wake of the spy balloon fiasco. And now we're just picking these things out of the sky left and right. Like, oh, suddenly we thought to look. Turns out there's all sorts of uh, espionage going on in our airspace. We did talk about that possibility 
recently. I'm looking at some of these pictures. I mean, you know, uh, of course we can get into and maybe folks have hot takes about the longer history of UFOs, the, you know, the question whether like, you know, these these photos from Salem, Massachusetts represent aliens or just some other perfectly explainable nothing to see here folks kind of event. I'm going to turn this over now uh, to the gang. Uh, which of these two explanations makes seems most plausible, more plausible to you guys? Uh, or is there some third possibility that's going on here? Or is the real news story simply uh, that our government seems to be scrambling frantically with no idea what to what it's doing? If we can't deal with foreign uh, items in our airspace, how the heck are we supposed to manage an invasion of Taiwan or other Chinese activity should it materialize in the future. What uh, what do you guys think about these unidentified flying objects? Well, our beloved um, mentor and uh, alas, dearly departed friend, senior fellow, Mike Yulman, he stole this from someone else. So I forget who the original, he would admit this too. Uh, he, I forget who the original is from, but he had, you know, a theory for government behavior called Yulman's razor, which is... Um, when stupidity is a sufficient explanation for a, an event or sequence of events, there's there's no need to have recourse to more sophisticated analysis. So I think it's, you know, it, it seems it's been reported now that they were tracking this, the Chinese balloon, the one that made the initial news and they shot down over South Carolina or off the coast of South Carolina after it had traipsed across the entire Western United States and really the entire continental United States in some fashion. They had been tracking it since it left its you know, Chinese uh, airship <laughs> base. And I think they were just planning on, I don't know, not letting anyone know that this sort of thing happens. And then it, it leaked and it became a story. And now they've kind of got to own all of it. There's a, I remember decades ago, I was, you, you look up statistics like this and it, it kind of gives you a sense of, of awe and, and impressive technology that I think something like at any given time, there are 30,000 people in the air above the United States flying around in commercial aircraft and private aircraft. I would not be surprised at all if at any given time there are five or six spy balloons <laughs> over the United States, uh, <laughs> mostly from China or or whatever. So yeah, I this just became a PR problem and now they're trying to, I guess, own it. And, you know, I just don't know if I buy this NORAD argument. I mean, can it really be the case that we had our sensors so dulled that we couldn't pick up spy balloons? Did we assume that any espion, you know, overhead sort of surveillance or spying by China wouldn't go all steampunk and balloon style and would have to be more sophisticated? So I, I just don't know what to make of any of it. Our friend David Goldman had the good point on Twitter, maybe this morning or yesterday, and he said, those who didn't live through the 60s fail to fully appreciate how much the press is a bunch of well-trained parrots on government lies and, and uh, obfuscations. So I think it's some sort of mix of all of those things that I just brought up. A compliant sort of lying press or just naive and, uh, and gullible press coupled with, uh, and th they're likely to be more gullible and naive when a Democrat's in the White House because their sort of uh, reflex is to trust, trust uh, their political tribe a little more than not. And so the, the whole thing just seems to be a fiasco. It's embarrassing. It's a national embarrassment. As to aliens, I don't know, Spencer. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm skeptical of that too, if only because the Ullman's razor does sort of dictate that uh, how could our, if our government can't keep the spy balloons under wraps, how could they possibly have kept, yeah. you know, extraterrestrial contact from us? But there is no explanation that I can think of that doesn't look bad. I mean, another version, I guess, of the part of the story where we've just kind of tuned up our radars, which I agree. It's like, how much more could we have tuned them up in that short period of time? Another version is like, we haven't tuned them up at all. It's just that the public has suddenly become aware of this kind of activity. And now we have to cover it in the news. Anyway, what do what the rest of you guys think? I, you know, I think um, Ryan's explanation sort of tracks, it sort of makes sense that, I mean, these things are prob they're probably happening all the time and it's, they know what it is. They know what it's about. And I mean, you have to figure like, I mean, how many balloons do we have floating over China? Right. I mean, I, isn't this the sort of thing that probably all countries are always doing to each other? And it's like, like who, who wants to get into a battle of shooting down each other's like balloons when you know what they're for? And 
you know, that we may have elaborate counter intelligent programs like trying to feed the balloons in disinformation. You know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> yeah. it just becomes like a com- <laughs> counter like balloon weird, ops. Yeah. yeah. It's like some weird game that the, that the intelligence agencies play with each other. And it's ultimately kind of like a wash and yeah. And it's an embarrassment that it came out and people are like, Oh, what's going on here? Um, but you know, it, I, I tend to think that the fact that they've managed the news about it so poorly, I mean, yeah, it's an embarrassment and it sort of shows up the hapless, feckless state of the administration and the regime whenever it has to explain itself. And like, you know, it's kind of when the press feebly sort of tries to press them for an answer and they can't even come up with a good one then. It's sort of a, just a sign of the decay of, of our regime. For fans of Dr. Strangelove and its wonderful spoof on the missile gap, we have to do something about this balloon gap. The balloon gap, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're lagging behind in balloon technology. Um, I think, well, you know, they say never attribute to malice that which is adequately, adequately explained by stupidity. Yeah. And my answer tends to be with all of these things. Oh, it's probably stupidity just all the way up and down always. But if it were malice, it's either a false flag to distract us from what's happening in Ukraine <laughs> or, or it's, I knew this was going to be a good episode. Go on. <laughs> or <laughs> it is definitely actually interdimensional entities that are preying on our godlessness and fear. So, <gasps> Yeah, it's got to be that. I mean, there really aren't say, any. M- say more. I mean, there are definitely interdimensional entities preying on our godlessness and fear, but I associate them more with like the statue now by Shazia Sikonada in the New York courthouse, like the kind of, <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. idol- yeah. idols that we raise to abortion. But but you think that it's possible that these I- UFOs are also somehow associated with uh, with the demons. Interdimensional. <sighs> yeah, it's, I didn't know we were going to go like, you know, the interstellar route and or demons thanks helen <laughs> we're gonna be Just wait we're gonna it. be writing a lot more about this on the site so i actually really want to know like wh- yeah. what makes you think that this particular series of phenomena <laughs> is attributable to demonic activity <laughs> oh my gosh i mean part of me is obviously trolling but then i also like unironically genuinely think that aliens are demons or like what we think of aliens and you know alien and abductions people who have these <laughs> saying this out loud no 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 um, i mean this tradition goes back to dante at least yeah, right yeah, the idea that the empyrean is somehow occupied by like you know supernatural beings who come totally down and, and sort of touch our reality or sort of break through you know the dimensions that interact with us in some way and you know many people have had really strange dreams if you've ever had, oh gosh, what is it? I, all I know, it, it's like when the witch is sitting on you, what do you call that? Sleep paralysis. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And it yep, just yep, feels, yep. you know, anyway. So people, have, everybody's had these weird paranormal sort of things. And I basically think that all of that stuff is literally demonic <laughs> like spiritual entities, like negative spiritual entities that are preying on us. <laughs> so... <laughs> Wow. That's, um, that's it. <laughs> this is like on Twitter recently, I think we were accused. I can't remember exactly how it worked, but it was like the Claremont Institute was somehow accused of seducing various other outlets, including the Red Scare podcast into far right evils. <laughs> and the Red Scare girls were like, I've never even heard of Claremont. But now I feel like we're basically running an episode of Red Scare. Like, I will say this is like. I, I shouldn't have said it goes back to Dante. It goes back way, way further than that. The notion that the spheres are moved by supernatural entities goes back at least to like the Plato's Timaeus. So the question then just becomes, Helen, like, are these beings from the superlunary or the sublunary sphere, right? Are they from above or below the moon? Because if they're above the moon, then they're angelic. But if they're below the moon, as it seems much more likely, they're they're satanic. And, and perhaps more seriously, like there does sort of need to be a way for talking about this stuff that is not as tinfoil hatted, but still acknowledges that we're not simply up against 
like yeah physical events like principalities and powers are real that's the yeah it, it's, it's not crazy no it's really not crazy and you know people are i was actually doing a podcast recently with alex gutentag who's the you know this brilliant woman who's who was doing all of like the best coverage on covid while it was happening because she was a teacher in california and then you know she got sort of discovered and picked up by compact and is just a, a great writer Anyway, and she's she's an entirely secular person, but she was sort of describing the social contagion and and said, you know, I can't find any other word to use but demonic. Um, mm. And I think a lot of people are in, are in this boat where they where they're sort of observing the political reality. And there are some things transgenderism certainly included the like predation upon children included that that are so it's not just evil it's like something beyond that something ritualistic and anti-christian in a really deep profound way and people don't i mean i i, I sort of giggle as i'm saying this because it does sound loony because maybe it was the satanic panic or whatever but the, any sort of talk of like negative spirituality powers and principalities and all that has sort of been branded as like you know, evangelical sort of lunacy, but, um, but it is real. And they do these, it, there are these sort of like infectious, virally negative political forces that really like take over people's brains in a way that is just. This is like Gerard's whole point, right? Yeah. I mean, Gerard, that like, you know, I, I'm probably simplifying it, but that Satan is basically the king of the world. For now, and all con everything about you know mimetic forms of interaction is essential. It's just like that is the demonic. So what seems like when we talk when people talk about the demonic or the satanic, they imagine things that are deeply hidden, like deep, deep, dark secrets. But in fact, it's like the palpable reality of the world. Mm. Um, yeah, it's so just right I, in front of your eyes. Yeah. Like, I'm really interested in the idea of the demonic. Is the demonic a metaphor for reality, or is reality actually a reflection of the demonic? Like, one of my favorite movies is Rosemary's Baby. And I have this take on it where it's like, yes, it's about how this apartment is, the whole building is taken over by Satanists. But really, is it actually kind of a metaphor for how? New York City co-ops are run like that. In <laughs> fact, New York mm. City apart, like that, just the relation of neighbors with one another and like all of the like, that's actually the satanic. Like it's it, it's actually like. Yep. The, the, yep. The like demonic, the reality is a metaphor for. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Ahead. The demonic is imbricated into like, you know, just everyday interactions. You don't need to be like summoning Satan. He's already there, in fact. Totally. Um, and I mean, another like great Girardian point just to jump in here is like yeah. that the the Hebrew Bible's best insight or one of the Hebrew Bible's like central insights about idol worshipers, worshipers of demons is that they don't know what they're doing. They're not self-aware. Like the whole point is that the Bible is the like third person view that tells you what they're actually doing. And so you kind of have to talk about this stuff in the you know, metaphorical or spiritual or demonic register, but it's not like you're describing something other than just what's actually going on. You're just describing yeah, it yeah. from the outside. Yeah, yeah precisely. I mean, I, this um, doesn't really, I guess, I don't know how this relates to the balloons. Yeah. <laughs> but I like it. I, I well, like the it. balloons are a metaphor for New York communes and apartments, okay. I think. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I, I suspect we are going to get a lot of letters about this, and I'm <laughs> personally very eager to uh, yeah, to too. read them. So, yeah, write into us. You guys know how to, how to find us. And let's transition into our next topic because it's not um, totally unrelated in the sense that it, it also has to do with a kind of mysterious confluence of events that people at least seem to feel can't be thoroughly explained by the official narratives. Um, this one is, uh, I think, definitely more serious, uh, which is to say it's it, causing more actual harm and suffering so far as we know directly. And uh, that is this just series of chemical spills, hazardous spills uh, around the country, the really 
big one is in Ohio. And that one is kind of it's one of these things that it just the, the big question is, why isn't it more in the news? For me, at least, you know, this seems to be causing real damage to the environment, potentially to you know people in the area. But it's not the only one that's been going on. Our producer, Jake, just like produced a, a list for me of other ones. And I'm just going to kind of read them off and then we can talk about them. Shelter in place order reinstated following hazardous spill on I-10 in Tucson. A crash involving a commercial tractor truck hauling liquid nitric acid on I Interstate 10. Uh, anhydrous ammonia leak prompts shelter in place order in part of Harris County, Texas. The chemical spill prompts hazardous materials investigation in Irvine. This stuff just kind of like seems to keep popping up. The Irvine one is is sort of a, a it's a little bit out of the let's say it's out of the central region of the the rest of them. But you know, I will just put on my tinfoil hat at the jump and kind of state my own like really kooky. And it's not it's it's really just like a, one of those felt like uh, pieces of twine that I'm connecting between all of these pins on my dartboard. And that is like, don't an awful lot of them seem to involve shelter in place orders, which is like, you know, I, I'm not saying that those aren't probably the right way to respond to an event like this, but it's, it is sort of like the shelter in place order is such an explosive flashpoint now ever since COVID for like stay in your house because all of these things are happening. And it's like, Sometimes it feels like there are a whole all these sorts of things that are I mean, climate emergencies is another one of them. There's all these sorts of things that either are happening or aren't or, or are being overblown that sort of all boil down to all like cash out in terms of you have to get locked in your home. Now, that is not to say I feel like this is all being kind of like engineered or orchestrated, but I'm going to toss that into the mix since we're really kind of airing our kookiest theories here that like I did happen to notice that a lot of these seem to be like shelter in place related. But I want to know what you got. I mean, like this is obviously these are real disasters. They seem to pose real, real danger. And I don't really know what to make of them or why they wouldn't be why they are kind of a fixation of like conservative media, but not of media generally well on one on one hand if you have like a a dying massive industrial nation mm -hmm. where with terrible infrastructure and all kinds and all kinds of externalized economic factors i imagine you're probably going to have a lot of massive industrial accidents at the same at, at the same time i think the conservative media is on top of it well there is a kind of you know doom and gloom side to to that, to that sector, but also because the other side just ain't reporting it. Like the New York Times, the only thing that they seem to report was like, "Oh, isn't this funny? This is just like um, in the movie White Noise." Like they just seem to think to make it like, "Oh, this is like an amusing thing that happened in Ohio, where there was recently a movie that involves a industrial accident like this one, and some of the people played extras and." Oh, how ironic or something. But I mean, what we saw was like this, the most, here, here's what I think. Like under, when Trump was president, the city of Flint, Michigan screwed up their own like water supply issues. So there was lead in the water. And this was assumed naturally just to be Trump's fault. There was no question. It wasn't the fault of Flint. It wasn't fault of Michigan. It wasn't Detroit. It was the fault of the president of the United States as a human rights disaster, an environmental catastrophe. Then we have this like thing that basically looks like Chernobyl. Everything I've read is like this is going to poison that entire area forever. And mm -hmm. the only thing you hear is the secretary of transportation talking about, you know, getting more. Uh, more racial representation, cross racial representation in hiring on his boondoggle bill. So, you know, they're just not paying attention to it. So I think that's kind of what's going on. I, you know, I, 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 I dearly hope that the government is not planning to um, unleash environmental catastrophe across the country and in, in order to keep everyone at home again, <laughs> you know, for the 24 election. But you know, I, I guess I wouldn't put it past them. The other aspect of this, and I, I don't mean to say suggest that I've read anything that suggests this, 
with the Ohio thing. And I, I realized that a couple of the other ones you described, Spencer, were just, you know, car accidents or truck accidents, especially the one in Arizona. But our friend Josh Steinman, 2022 20, Lincoln Fellow, veteran of the Trump administration, he was uh, in charge of cyber at the National Security Council. Josh has started a company called Galvanic, which specializes in industrial system security. And Josh's point to anyone who will listen is this is just a huge and underappreciated risk across the United States. That is to say, anywhere you have any plant facilities plugged into the internet, they are vulnerable to uh, sabotage and the unleashing, you know, sort of remote controlled uh, catastrophic failure. And so that would be a certainly a tool of uh, espionage and or terrorism. I don't mean to suggest that Ohio is anything like that. I just want to raise it as something to keep an eye out for in the future. As for all of these at the same time, I mean, I think it's kind of like the balloon, Spencer. I think, you know, yeah. there's, there's probably an industrial accident or spill like every week across the country. It just, the, this big thing in Ohio has perked everyone up, I think, to the news about all these things more. And and it's just a, probably a, a mix of bad luck and uh, and the big uh, event in Ohio, which seems to, you know, the, to the extent that the normal media covers it, it's to downplay it if they cover it at all, as Seth suggested. The whole thing is, is uh, I, yeah, I'm with, I'm with Seth. Not only do I hope, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that your worst case scenario of conspiracy uh, is probably not, not anywhere near the truth, which is to say, uh, find ways to shut down the country again. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> that makes, that does make me feel better. <laughs> Let's the industrial that. collapse one is almost worse, though, I will say. Uh, yeah, Helen, it sounds like you want to get in here. Sorry. Well, I, I was actually just about to say that, that the sort of um, whether whether it's, you know, malice or incompetence, once again, the idea of our industrial systems collapsing is so much scarier, honestly, than an acute environmental incident, which is really scary in and of itself. Like if I were there in East Palestine or Palestine, I've heard it both ways. Um, I would get my family and get out, you know, like the pets are dying, fish are dying. If you're feeding your baby on formula, you need to run a, a million miles away. Like uh, mm. it, it just seems very bad. But and I, I tweeted this earlier this week, this, it feels like Chernobyl, like both in the immediately obvious sense that it's a really bad catastrophe for the, the health and the, of the environment and the, and the people in the area, but even more sort of profoundly in, in the <laughs> sort of late stage empire feel of a major incident and a follow-up that is a really strange mixture of incompetence and cover-up and collusion with the media <laughs> to portray things as normal. I mean, most of the most of the information that is coming out is coming out through like TikTok and just people being able to record things on their own and publish it, um, you know, yeah. through through these social media platforms, and that's that's. It's all, that's almost scarier than just having chemicals in the water, you know? Yeah, it's, it's analogous to COVID in that sense. Remember the like first few weeks, you know, whether it was manipulation on the part of China or not, you know, the most information people had were like, you know, uh, people walking around in hazmat suits in empty Chinese cities and it just fed this hysteria about what was going on. So the social media, mm. the sort of live, you know, live from my smartphone aspect of our of the the media environment doesn't help any of this stuff and it just fuels i think conspiratorial speculation about all these things as indeed i was doing just a moment ago quite irresponsibly <laughs> with my uh yeah. with my vague <laughs> speculation but i mean i will say helen you know you make a great point which is kind of that <laughs> malice and incompetence aren't uh mutually exclusive and just because somebody's you know neglecting something out of pure stupidity doesn't mean that they wouldn't neglect it out of malice had they the, uh, the option to do the alternative. And so, like, those two things can really be combined in a lot of ways. Totally. Hey, can and, I just and, start? Oh, oh sorry. sorry go on. Well, I was just going to say, you know, evil people are stupid fundamentally because if you, if you knew that you were doing evil and you still did it and you recognize that it was evil, it, you, you have to know, too, that it was a stupid decision because you're going to be punished by your creator for doing that. So. There is a there's a sort of 
they're bo- it's both. Why not both is my favorite question. Yeah, why don't we have yeah. both? It's very Socratic. And as long as we're talking about evil and stupid, I'm just really fascinated by the figure of Pete Buttigieg in this. Mm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, because here's this guy, and he's so blithe and so like Im- it, unperturbed about anything that happens. And he's like perfect at giving like this like quaffed response. Any terrible thing that happens, it's always like, oh, well, why is the supply chain screwed up? Why are the ships backed up? And he's just like, well, you know, we've got three problems. We had COVID. We had a uh, tremendous demand. You know, people really wanted to buy stuff. You know, but here's what I think the deal is with him. It's like he comes out of this this consulting background, like McKinsey or whatever. Mm. And it's like the way ju- like junior executive training, they're like, you're going to go on rotation. And we're going to first we're going to put you into manufacturing and you'll go down on the floor and see how the you know, the widgets are made and we're going to put you into logistics and you're going to go into finance and marketing. And, you know, you'll get around the whole business and you'll see how everything works. Hmm. And similar to his um, military career, it's a little bit like that. It's like he's like this um, junior officer being groomed. So it's like, yeah, you're going to be in transportation for, you know, two or four years. And don't really worry about what's going on there. Just get a feel for like what it's like to run a big department. And then maybe we'll put you in charge of state or defense. And then you can be president. And that's kind of like his attitude. It's like he doesn't, he's just like, oh, this is interesting. Uh, A big train derailment. I wonder uh, who's going to clean that up. Uh, (laughs) It's fascinating, right? I mean, that not that like his attitude? Like he's, He's in it for, he's got other things going on. He has a career to play. Yeah. Wow, yeah, breezing through en route. His sights yeah. are set higher than uh, the mundane troubles of <laughs> yeah. East Palestine, Ohio. I, I just want to say for the record, too, those of you who've driven across this country, it's so great how many odd names there are for towns across the country, like East Palestine, Ohio, or Palestine made me think of, you know, driving through Maine, you can go to Peru, Maine, and this sort of stuff. Uh, I don't know what it yeah, says about yeah. America, but it's it's sort of, uh, it's a product of our newness as a country and and just, uh, I think, the, the uh, amusing quirkiness of the town naming American from days past. Totally. It never occurred to me uh, about that, that Memphis, Tennessee is like named after Memphis, Egypt, until I was driving through the region and I realized that it's just part of a stretch of towns that are all named after the great like metropolis yeah. cities. Like of, there's a of Cairo, Maine. I'm sure there's a Cairo, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then in that area, there's like an Alexandria. There's I think there's Rome. I mean, it's yeah, it's it's pretty <clears throat> bonkers. I love it. It's very ambitious. It's like civil, that's civilizational confidence right there. That's like yeah. we've got right. it all. Yeah. Um, now, now we're naming all of our streets and cities yeah and like after, after like land. yeah like like racial bureaucrats or like or fake civil I mean? rights <laughs> heroes like yeah exactly george floyd avenue yeah <laughs> the uh <laughs> the oh there, there's one last thing that we that we want to talk about before we get into talking about our favorite pieces on the site so let me let me bring this up ryan has suggested that we inflict upon ourselves and one another this video from uh, the from Columbia University Medical School, um, and it's it, uh, this is going to be a blind react for me. I don't know if you guys have watched this before, but we're going to have producer Jake play. Uh, I, I what I guess Chris Rufo tweets: "It's the mantra of critical race theory. This is the DEI cult in the wild." And Ryan we should, uh, yeah. retweeted it. Yeah, go and on. we should explain just just for context: it is the commencement of Columbia Medical School, I believe. Great. So okay. So this yeah. is their graduation, basically. Yeah. Um, cool. Let's uh, let's listen to it. We enter the profession of medicine with appreciation for the opportunity to build on the scientific and humanistic achievements of the past. We also recognize the acts and systems of oppression affected in the name of medicine. We take this oath of service to begin building a future grounded in truth restoration and equity yeah so we're just going to play a few clips and translate them as we go through so mm-hmm. i just want to set the stage for people so this is there's a woman up at the podium i assume she's the dean of the med school or something and everyone uh, the shot is either of her or of the crowd and they all have these sheets in front of them with presumably this oath that they're all taking uh 
And uh, I just wanted to flag it for folks. We've been talking about this kind of thing quite a bit, but this is the sort of thing that is infecting even our medical schools. Um, just, I mean, there are all these flag words, of course, should set off uh, your antenna or antennae, uh, systems of oppression, uh, equity, all these catchphrases from our current um, hysterical uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion freak out, uh, which unfortunately is <clears throat> more than just the fad of certain uh, eso or eccentric academic departments. It's now infecting our professional schools, law schools, med schools, um, it's trying to creep into the hard sciences and engineering. Uh, it's, it, it must consume all. And uh, so I, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll play just a couple more clips and, uh, and uh, get people's reactions. But before we do that, I don't, I don't know if anyone, Seth or Spencer, anyone had an initial. I've listened to this, but Spencer's doing it uh, uh, live. Yeah, me too. <laughs> We're so doing it live. It, yeah, it sounds like, I mean, just the vibe, right? I'm not even, lis not even listening to what they're saying, but just the woman's kind of drone and what you hear, the mumbling in the back. And this is kind of like, I don't know, if, if we were in like um, East Turkmenistan, uh, in like a Uyghur concentration camp, listening <laughs> to the people like reciting like whatever Mao said about such and such. I mean, that's that's the vibe I get. Yeah, I have the same exact reaction. Like, exactly. It just feels... Once again, tying a lot of different strings together that have been set out throughout the podcast, it feels vaguely Soviet, vaguely demonic, does mm. not pass the vibe check. <laughs> <laughs> and Soviet and demonic in this context, given what we've been talking about, are like almost synonyms. So you're right, like it ties a lot of this stuff together. Um, I should have said at the outset, this is our This Is Fine segment for the uh, for the week, which is the segment where we talk about uh, like something that's kind of going on in the background. And Ryan, you laid it out really well. Like this stuff is going on, even if you think like, quote unquote, wokeness is over or whatever, like this stuff is happening and people, young people are uh, internalizing it. I mean, the the part that really struck me about that opening was that it began with something that I would almost be like, it, it's not inherently like chanting is wrong, you know, like saying reciting creeds together. Um, it's easy to feel like that's just inherently sinister because these people who are doing that are sinister. But it's like they actually begin with something that you could all you could get behind and then you sort of fall asleep. And it's like, oh, and suddenly <laughs> I'm like in the middle of like systemic oppression and yeah, all these right. buzzwords, you know, like they, that's kind of how they always do it. Uh, I think it's, it's very uh, it's an effective tactic, despite being like utterly terrifying. <laughs> OK, Is we can listen to more of it. Yeah, go ahead. I just I I. That is a great point that you made, and it's actually something that Bella Dodd, who was one of the um, most popular, you could say, effective is the better word, um, mm. communist agitators in the United States in uh, the, the 50s. Um, that is a tactic that she herself described um, mm. the, the communists using in teachers' union meetings. And by the way, this is a woman who put thousands of communists in New York teachers unions, thousands of communists in seminaries. Um, anyway, very interesting woman. But um, yeah, she, she describes this tactic uh, as, as go, going as a way of recruiting people to, of course, first come out with the least offensive position possible, something usually about um, raising the pay or raising you know, salaries for teachers. And then just using that this completely inoffensive thing to shoehorn in um, all sorts of uh, nonsense and to just subtly recruit people to your side and then just wear on them slowly, slowly, slowly over time until all of a sudden they're communists and they don't even know it. <laughs> this is great. I, I feel like I thought that I was the like uh, that I had sort of observed this on my own but it's really nice to know that there's like a, a expressed philosophy of this it's the skin suit philosophy it's where the where the institution is a skin suit and use it use the trust that people have in it to get them on your side um let's uh let's listen to more of this stuff to fulfill medicine's capacity to liberate i promise to take care of my future patients by engaging in dialogue listening to their lived experience and tailoring my recommendations to their unique circumstances <laughs> so uh the capacity of medicine to liberate so in like a normal non-crazy 
uh, time in American history. I guess it's it's a weird phrase, but that would be medicine liberates us from I don't know the travails of the body to a certain extent or something. But in this context, it's it's pretty remarkable. And then as as our uh, as I think our colleague Charles Kessler joked at one of our meetings, Spencer. <laughs> This lived experience business. He's like, is what is what is an isn't all experience lived? I don't understand. <laughs> what experience is unlived? Yeah, but these are just I more more watchwords from uh, uh, kind of critical social justice realm, as our colleague Scott Yenner might call it. Um, let's play. Uh, let's play the next one. I acknowledge the past and present failures of medicine to abide by its obligation to do no harm and affirm the need to address systemic issues in the institutions I uphold. I promise to critically examine the systems and experiences that impact every person's health and ability to receive care. I vow to use this knowledge to uplift my patients and disrupt the injustices that harm them as I forge the future of medicine. Man, uh, your residency is getting a lot harder if you got to do all this in addition to, uh, you know, treating patients, um, <laughs> systems of oppression, uh, uh, not living up to their, to the Hippocratic, oath, to do no harm to the oath, to do no harm, the old Hippocratic oath. Um, yeah, I, I just, you wonder, I mean, some normal person listening to all this, a lot of it sounds kind of benign if you're not schooled in all these terms, but what they're really talking about for the most part is a, you know, disparate impact as applied to health results. Uh, that's what a lot of this is about for anyone that's been following this debate as it's rolling through the med schools. Uh, it's also disparate impact in, I think, um, you know, a percentage of persons of color, you know, becoming doctors and going through med school and thus uh, being able to treat like persons of color adequately because their lived experiences matches up with their patients. You know, all of this is behind all this. And the, the disparate impact side is, um, you know, you're, it's, it's becoming suspect or problematic now in uh, the medical profession to acknowledge group differences in health outcomes as a sort of prerequisite for treating patients. So, uh, you know, even acknowledging the obvious fact, reality fact that, um, you know, black patients are higher incidences of heart disease and hypertension or are more prone to sickle cell anemia or take your racial pick and, um, you know, I, you know, uh, oh, anyway, I mean, they do for pe some people know this who've, who've, um, have friends who, uh, are chatty about it and have been through the obstetrics experience, but they have specific tests they'll run on you, uh, run on your offspring in utero tests. If you're say two Ashkenazi Jews getting married and having children, because, because of the Eastern European genetic pressure cooker of the last 800 years, there's higher incidences of certain weird neurological diseases, Tay-Sachs and others amongst uh, two Ashkenazi Jews marrying and having children. So any and all of this, of course, the the current woke medical regime is not that worried about Jews as the, well, they're now, you know, as Seth has written about, uh, they're now basically white people, so we don't have to worry about them. Uh, but they're very concerned about, um, you know, black patients, their experiences, the quote unquote systems of oppression and systemic racism that uh, influences their their health outcomes so that's that's really behind most of this uh, this chant and I just it's just extraordinary uh, I think we just have if we have two more clips let's just play to the end and I, I just want to flag for everyone just wait for it uh, I've just find I find the very end where we'll, where, where we'll cut this off I think in about 30 seconds uh, particularly uh, hilarious and just emblematic of the whole thing Go for it. I promise to self-reflect diligently, to confront unconscious prejudices, and to develop the skills, knowledge, and character necessary to engender an inclusive, equitable field of medicine. Let us bow our heads in recognition of the gravity of this oath. We swear to oh faithfully engage with these ideals and obligations for the ongoing betterment of medicine and humanity. <laughs> Jesus. Holy I don't know if y'all are recording while the <laughs> clip is playing, but for our audience, I actually it, it uncontrollably, involuntarily gasped when they bowed their heads. That's, I wish that had been crazy. That part unbelievable. was crazy. I feel so vindicated, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Go on. Why?
I mean, well, because, because the it's obvious religion. Reason. Because it's religion. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah, religious. Yeah. It's it's. Yeah, I won't go on about Bella Dodd, but when asked <laughs> when asked by Alice von Hildebrand at the end of her life, uh, who who is the who's the leader of global communism? She said Satan. <laughs> Man, I mean, honestly, it's like if you do, if you're sitting here thinking we're kooks for talking about like demonic powers, this is kind of a good, you're right. This is like a great vindication. Um, my only, the only thing I have to add to any of this is like this, this is a good example of something for which a trial balloon was floated during COVID. I mean, you remember during the vaccine rollout, they, they had this yeah. whole thing about equity and, uh, and like preferring certain racial groups over others mm -hmm. in medical care. So I guess it's, uh, I guess it's dogma now. I, I just thought it was perfect that the female sort of, mommy overseer who are leading everyone in the chant at the end you know sort of has a little yeah. uptick of humanity you know just like a, a nice <laughs> um. capstone on the whole thing it's just uh, it's just so saccharine and fake you know what it, and it, it, makes, it makes me think it's like you know the whole thing about the handmaid's tale like that was like you know a book in the 80s whatever and then under trump it became a huge thing and they made um the movie the tv show about it and everybody would dress as handmaids what they don't get is like we're living in the Handmaid's Tale, except like the handmaids are actually the ones in charge of everything. <laughs> like totally. this, whole this whole gynocracy, like they're the ones running the show. They're the the fascist overlords. Whatever. This was absolutely that was so such projection that like moment when Handmaid's Tale became a thing. Besides, like, yeah, well, that that's a, it's a tone's everything. Um, this was this was thank you for bringing this to us to our attention, Ryan. This was a really good little primer in like the structure of this rhetoric and, and what's behind yeah. it. And um, yeah, that's, and I, that's awesome. And it shows the, I think, you know, everyone's kind of finally waking up to all this. You remember like in the nineties, uh, there was some hysteria about the, um, the kind of explosion of ridiculous wokeism and stuff on campuses, you know, Alan, or Alan Charles Coors or Charles Allen Coors, I, you know, wrote this whole book about the racial hysteria on campuses and the poor Jewish kid who, you know, got, thrown through a kangaroo court for for yelling at at a bunch of uh, black f his fellow students outside his window late at night he was trying he called them water buffalo or something and everyone freaked out and thought this was some weird anthropomorphizing racism when there's really like an old yiddish uh, sort of saying for noisy boisterous people being like water buffalo anyway all this kind of stuff and at the time the response was yeah i mean look it's it's ridiculous but it's really just on some campuses and really the really fancy campuses and it's just like the cultural studies department doing all this crazy stuff and none, none of the students really take it seriously and you know college is just kind of crazy like it doesn't most kids keep their heads down and and you know it'll be fine 30 years later we're, we're fully realizing the wages of that uh, foolish dismissal of all of that and it's it's going to infect everything med school uh, included. I, my big question would be like how many, I would love to survey that class of graduating folks and see how many of them uh, thought it was ridiculous and, or even, you know, it didn't sound like all that many of those, those, it was, it looked like a big class. It didn't sound like all of them were enthusiastically chanting along. I bet a lot of people were just, uh, you know, in like when you're a choir, when you're in the choir at, you know, 10, 11 years old and you don't want to sing, you can just mouth watermelon, watermelon, watermelon over no. and it looks like mm -hmm. you're singing. You know, I wonder how much of that is actually going on. Well, this does speak to, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just, I'll finish by just saying, unfortunately, this is, you know, this is now infecting uh, accreditation and licensing and all the rest. So it's, uh, even if they're chanting unenthusiastically, there's no escape. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this does speak to uh, these, these, what are they called? These, these, this is fine segments are supposed to look in some respects at uh, what, what people might do. And the first thing I think in this context, you're saying, Ryan, is like, notice it, understand the gravity. Don't t t believe them when they tell you who they are, when they bow their heads in prayer to like, you know, the satanic forces. And then the other one is, from Solzhenitsyn, right? Like live not by lies. He has that, that passage in that speech where he says like, if it's too much, to, if it's too scary right now to tell the truth, just don't say the lie. Like the, the there's, there's a difference between I'm going to get up and I'm going to like stick my neck out and not everybody like has that, whatever that, that energy, those vibes, but just don't mouth the lie. It's like a really good first step. Yeah. I'd like to know how many of those guys and gals believe this as well. And as we continue to run through part of my tweet, I should acknowledge that I just, I, basically retweeted Chris Rufo. He's got, he's an eagle eye for all this stuff. So thank you, Chris, 
for spreading the, the word. I, I should think that if you can solve the kind of accreditation licensing problem, as we run through this, this awful experiment in priding skin color over merit and competence, you're going to see a gap begin to emerge between, you know, it's like the, the health engineering or pilot version of go, go woke, go broke. Unfortunately, for a couple of them, it'll be like go woke and, you, you know, you die as a patient or you fall out of the sky. There's just going to be huge market opportunity, both for credentialing institutions to say, this is actually a merit, meritocracy at this institution of higher ed. You should trust doctors that come out of here more than, say, Columbia. So it could be a nice vehicle for the discreditation uh, or the discrediting of discreditation, not a word, the discrediting mm -hmm. of uh, a lot of our elite institutions who can't help themselves but participate in this kind of thing. Uh, and it should be a huge market opportunity both for institutions and for professional associations to say, you know, we're non-woke and we're competent uh, and you can trust all of our members in said profession regardless of their skin color because we've sort of verified them all. It's no way to run a railroad, that's for sure. It's no way to hold a, a multi-racial uh, republic together. Yeah, beautifully, beautifully said. This stuff does present an opportunity, and there are folks out there who are, who are seizing it, but we could do with a whole lot more if that's what you feel called to. In the time that remains, let us do the famous <laughs> read the damn site section of the podcast, where we each pick a piece and send people to AmericanMind.org to read it. I will kick us off as is my want, and I'm going to recommend a piece that is titled The Droid Stares Back. And I, uh, you, people know that the editors pick the titles of these things, so I, I'm, this is not the only reason I'm recommending this piece. In fact, far from it. But I'm inordinately proud of this title, The Droid Stares Back. It's about the uh, relationship between human, real human consciousness and fake AI human consciousness. It's by Michael Martin, his first time on our site and i just thought this was a beautifully done executed piece about the the perils of uh, persuading ourselves that ai is real or rather that it's really alive the perils of potentially you know building ai that has the um that mimics our consciousness and and believing in it he gives some lovely little references at the end that i had not heard of before and that help us to think through what might be coming down the pike. The Droid Stares Back by Michael Martin at AmericanMind.org. Go check it out. I can go next. I mm -hmm. really enjoyed by Daniel Mahoney, uh, England in Crisis. I um, am a real Anglophile and have a <laughs> problematic royal family obsession. And in this essay, he really interestingly and in, in and brilliantly sort of lays out um, why, among other things, why um, the monarchy sort of kowtowing to some of the modern liberal norms is really spelling out its own decline and, you know, death. Not to, I'm, I'm overstating the point. He does not. But uh, it's a great piece. Helen, as, a, as our resident expert on the royal family, What's your over under on the dissolution of Meghan and Harry's marriage? I knew, I knew you were going to say nah. that. <laughs> That's a great question. I, I said on the last podcast that I really, I, I, I thought that her, her sort of fading into the background as he is going on all the late night shows and, and sort of, the, you know, I wanted to say doxing his family, obviously not doxing, <laughs> but, you know, like exposing his family and taking all the heat. Um, I thought her, her sort of retreating was a real clear example of her sort of letting him hang himself on his own. And it seems like she's making, she continues to make these sort of moves to differentiate herself from her husband. And this to me is all indicative of a little bit of monkey branching, as they say in manosphere circles, when a woman grabs, uh, puts her hand on a new thing before she decides to release the, <laughs> the original branch. Uh, uh -huh. and, and so I, I think that she's, she's sort of paving her way. I couldn't give you, I don't know. I, 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 you I don't know. have to give an actual answer. I just, I, yeah, I don't have I an to wind you up answer. a bit, let you go. <laughs> no, I, I, believe me when it comes to Meghan Markle, I could, I could just go off, but I, I'll, I'll stop yeah. myself. So, yeah. So you don't think her letting him take the lead on some of this PR stuff is her re-embracing the patriarchal uh, familial uh, <laughs> arrangement. Okay. Yeah. 
<laughs> LOL. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I liked Joel Kotkin's piece, which is in today's, it's up on the site right now. It's called uh, Mysteries of the Labor Force. You know, it's classic Joel Kotkin, like really tying together all of this demogra- all this demographic data and, you know, labor data and all, you know, just, and talking about, you know, like how many, what, what a high percentage of people with BAs are doing, you know, working as like baristas or basically working in jobs that don't really require a bachelor's degree. You know, if there's any job that really requires a bachelor's degree, look, it's classic Kotkin. If you like Kotkin, you'll like it. And if you don't know Kotkin, this is a good place to um, get started on him. Yeah, excellent. I will uh, use this as an opportunity, as I sometimes do, for shameless institutional plugging. Uh, Just go read Scott Yenner on how Texas A&M went woke and then – track down, I believe it's linked in the piece. Uh, if you're interested, Scott's a bigger report on Texas A&M. So Scott's been doing these around the country. He's finishing up one for Florida on the Florida state systems. Uh, Scott and Arthur Miller. I don't know. Did you guys mention it all last week, Spencer, that we were all in Tallahassee? I haven't listened. I to don't know that I, I, I have talked about Yenner's. I've talked about Scott's work, but I don't think I talked about it last Scott week. Scott so and yes, Ar- Arthur Millick and Mike Anton and, uh, Steve Hayward, an old friend of Claremont, we were all in Tallahassee uh, meeting with uh, the governor and some of his legislative allies, uh, partly to announce Scott's position as our new senior director for state coalitions to be based in Tallahassee. So we're going to be working a lot more on uh, a lot of this diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff in higher ed. Of course, the governor's leading the way already with the new college and all this stuff he's doing on the ground there. So we hope to, uh, to help augment all of those efforts and then to do other sort of policy advising as well. So go check out Scott's piece, How Texas A&M, A&M Went Woke. And uh, if you want more of this stuff, we have all these reports up under Scott's byline at dc.claremont.org. And then I just, just want one honorable mention, a uh, first time poster on the American Mind, Benjamin Braddock. Uh, some of you know him. It's a, that's his suit on Twitter. Uh, Dr. Ben Braddock has written a nice piece on Georgia Maloney. Um, Italy's new prime minister called Maloney ascends and uh, Ben knows the politics of Italy pretty well. And uh, it's a good, good and insightful piece with a certain amount of verve as well. And uh, it's good because Maloney has uh, verve in spades herself. So it's fun to read a, a lively piece about her and just to learn more about this very interesting development in Italy. Yeah, absolutely. That, I think that was James's pick last week and ah, it deserves it. two mentions. No, that, that piece rocks and, and so does Braddock. So uh, it's cool that he's in our pages I'll or f- digital pages. Forgive me, audience. I don't listen to the podcast that I miss always. So uh, forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to uh, out no, no, you there, don't. Ryan. It's the, <laughs> a rock, and, rock on. Okay, great. Um, this was a really fun episode, you guys. Like I said, I expect we're going to get some notes about it and we welcome that. Um, but For now, we're going to thank you all for listening to The Roundtable. If you'd like to learn more about our podcast, our other projects, and the work of the Claremont Institute, there are many, many places that you can go. First of all, you can go to AmericanMind.org, as we've just been plugging. But you can also go to ClaremontReviewOfBooks.com, Claremont.org, and you can donate to help support us at Claremont.org slash donate. We can't do what we do without you, so that's uh, something we are always very grateful for. Um, And you can, if you like... um, you know, make a make a pitch for a shout out on the show. If you prefer to remain anonymous, that you're more than welcome to. But if you want to mention in the notes that you're a roundtable listener, um, we will definitely give you a give you a shout out. More than happy to do that. Thanks as always to our production crew, uh, Logan Zepieri and Jake Gannon. I think I forgot to mention the DC Center. Um, if you like Scott Yenner's work or any of those other guys that uh, we mentioned from that side of things, it's DC Claremont. Dot org. I think I have now plugged everything we're doing. It's hard to keep track these days, which kind of, which is kind of awesome. But that's all from us for now. Thank you all very much for listening. Don't forget to give us five stars and share as much as possible. That really helps the show. And we will talk to you next week. <laughs>